My name's Julie Kelly and today I'd like to talk about forgiveness and kind of try to get a debate going about whether or not we actually need forgiveness to be happy. So first of all we need to look at what forgiveness actually is and why we forgive Now all around us we see and hear people talking about forgiveness. We hear the um, church talking about turning the other cheek. We see people, and we've even done it ourselves, a lot of us, who forgive partners who've been unfaithful. You know, they go and they give their heart to someone else and we're heartbroken. But we take them back, we forgive them. Then we have people who live in the most horrendous abusive situations, domestic abuse for example, and over and over again they take that partner back and they forgive them. And we've even had the extreme cases like for example Ava Kaur, who was a victim of, or should I say a survivor of the Holocaust, because she managed to escape the death camps and she went on to forgive the person who killed every member of her family in the camps. So forgiveness is such a powerful thing. But do we need it to be happy? Well, some people would agree that we do, because when we forgive, it's said that we free the mind. It has very little to do with the other person or situation, but it's about freedom of our own mind and our own spirit. Without forgiveness, we become enraged and encompassed in that cocoon of anger, suffering and pain. And nobody wants to be involved in all that. Nobody wants to be wrapped up in all that. But yet we do it, even though we know it's wrong. So let's look at a more profound example of forgiveness. And this example I'm going to share with you is one that was given by Jack Cornfield, who's a renowned speaker, an incredible Buddhist scholar. And I was listening to Jack Cornfield today on one of the talks on TV, the TED Talks, and it was so profound and I'm going to share it with you right now. So Jack Cornfield tells the story, a really profound and poignant story of a young boy who's murdered for no other reason than his murderer needed to get into a gang. He needed to belong somewhere as part of a community. Now the boy who killed the murderer, it's debatable what was going on in his life, you know, the nurturing aspect, the parenting, and that's another issue. But basically, this boy had become involved in a gang. He was only 14 years old, and he needed that belonging. They were taking care of him. They were offering him something that he didn't have in his inner world, and that was a sense of belonging. So in order to get into this gang, he had to be initiated And part of this initiation was to go out and murder someone. And if he did that, then, yeah, he was part of the gang. So he went out and he killed an innocent 14-year-old boy, somebody his own age. Just killed, gunned down for no reason. And, of course, he was caught, he was apprehended, it went to court. And the murdered boy's mum was sitting in the court and listening to all of this story this this senseless murder of her son and when the boy was being led away he got sentenced he was being led away into the um, cells she stood up in the court and she said to him she looked straight at him and she said I will kill you and he went and then a year on she went to visit this boy in prison and she needed to talk to him she needed to find out his story, why he took the life of her son. And they talked. And then from that, she visited him regularly and she started to go every month and she would take him cigarettes, she'd take him money and they'd sit and talk. Now, he could have refused those visits. The prisoner has the right to refuse. 
Some will agree and some will disagree with that, but they have the right to refuse. But he went to those visits and the visits increased to every week. And she was going regularly and she would sit with him, she would talk with him, she would take him things. Um, and that's what happened. And then came the time when he was going to be released. And she said to him, so what, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do with it? And he said, I don't know. I don't know. Things are going over in my head. I need to do something with my life, but I don't know what, what I can do. And she said, well, what are you going to do? What, what, what would you like to do as a job? What do you want to work as? And he said, I, don't, I really don't know. I don't have a clue. And she said, well, look, I have a relative. He can give you a job. I can get you a job with him. And, you know, you'll be sorted. You'll have your own money coming in. You know, the offer's there. So he took the offer. And then she said to him, but whilst you're saving up to get a place to live, where are you going to stay? And he said, you know, ma'am, I don't know. I have no clue about what's going to happen to me now. From being a young boy, I was involved in this gang and I've got nowhere to stay. I've got nowhere. And she said, well, you can come and stay with me. I have a spare room. And she took him in and he stayed with her and he worked and he paid his way. And he lived with her for a few years. And one day... It took a few years for this to happen, but one day, well, one evening, she said to him, come sit down, I need to talk to you. So he sat down in her living room and she sat down. She lived alone. There was just her and her son at the time. And then he got killed and there was just her. So she sat down with him and she said to him, I need to ask you something. Do you remember that night you killed my son? And you got arrested. And then it was the court case. And in that court case, I stood up and I said, I was going to kill you. And he looked at her and he said, I, I can never forget that day. I can never forget that day. It's etched on my mind. I won't forget your words. And she leaned over to him. She said, well, I did. I didn't want you to come out of prison to be a murderer again. I didn't want you to come out and kill someone else. And I did not want you to come out of prison with no purpose in your life and no direction. And I did not want you to come out and get involved in the same gang that brought you to murdering my son. And she said to him, I did kill you. You've emerged from this a different person. Now she said, before you murdered my son, and she did use the word murder, she emphasised it. And she said, before you murdered my son, it was me and him, we lived together, we supported each other. But now he's gone. And I miss him. And she said, I need a son. I'd like to adopt you. Would you allow that? And he said, yeah. And she did. Now that is an amazing story of forgiveness. It's so profound. There were tears streaming down my cheeks when I heard that. But we're all capable of that. You know, we're all capable of it. And before I was speaking about people who take partners back after they've been abusive and they can kick 10 bells out of them and they'll still take them back. And that is because they forgive them and they bring them back in the belief that they will change. They forgive the badness in them in the belief that they will change. And the sceptics among us will say, well, somebody like that is never going to change. What's the point in forgiving them all the time, letting them get away with it? Well, the point is, it's for our own sanity. We do it, we let go of anger in the hope someone else will change. Now, we can't change someone else's behaviour, but we can impact it, we can influence it. The person who murdered the woman's son that Jack Cornfield was talking about... Well, he has his karma to bear. He's killed someone, he's murdered someone. And that karma will be assessed and it will affect him in his, his next life from a Buddhist point of view, which I am. So what's the point in us hanging on to that anger? What is the point in us destroying our life? It's already going to be dealt with. 
And to live in a mind like that, to live in a life like that, where you come into this world as a killer, well, that's more, that more warrants compassion than anger. Fancy living a life like that. So this is one of the reasons why forgiveness, I believe, is so important. But then it comes to, if we forgive all of these things, all of these people, you know, I mentioned Eva Kaur, who forgive the person who executed all her family in the Holocaust, in the camps, the death camps. That family have gone. Yes, it hurt, it destroyed, she witnessed all of that. But what is the point in allowing that to torment her life forever? There comes a point where you have to let it go and you have to renounce that anger. Forgiveness is about freeing the self, but it can change someone else's life. When you tell someone you forgive them, they can't come back with anger. So you change the path of their karma. And in doing so, you preserve your own mental and physical well-being. Now, I have a very, very good example from personal experience of how that works. And I'll speak about that in a few minutes. So I'm now going to share with you my personal experience. In 2005, my partner was murdered in a terrible knife attack. It was frenzied, it was violent, and he was killed. And I'm not going to go into the story as such, but I forgave his killer. We sat and we talked and I forgave him. And in that process, I was working with people who had worked in the criminal justice system. I was working as a social worker. So I came into contact with people in authority and they would say to me, listen, forgiving him is just going to get away with his crime. There is too much of this forgiveness, too much of these do-gooders in the world, too much of this, let them get away with it. And I stopped and I thought to myself, you know what? He already did it, right? He already did it. He's gotten away with it in terms of killing my partner. But he's paying for what he's done. Now, you might argue that, yeah, they have satellite TVs, they have all the perks in prison, and some of that's true. I'm not denying that. But the picture we create in our own mind of what's really going on can be very different to what's actually happening. So I met with this man, and we talked. We talked. And I forgave him. I put my arms around him, I hugged him, and I told him, now we have to let this go. We have to move on. I have to move on and you have to move on. Because what was happening to him in prison, he was tormented by his own mind. He was tormented by the fact he'd killed not one person, but he'd killed before. And he was tormented by the fact he was doing these things without a thought. He couldn't understand his own mind why he was doing it. He was consumed with rage, with hatred for himself. But knowing that he had to live with the fact he'd taken life. Now you can blame that on a bad upbringing. Yes, he grew up in Scotland. He was the only Catholic in a Protestant area. So carrying knives around was commonplace. You can blame it on that. The fact he'd grown up needing to protect himself. You can blame it on a whole range of things. But when it comes down to it, it comes down to the fact that he chose not to change. But that's not just him, you know. Me being angry with him, me being out for revenge and killing him for because he's killed my partner, it solves nothing. And then what about my willingness to change? What about my willingness to change from being trapped in rage and anger to being a compassionate mind, a compassionate heart towards this man? What is there in life that says that doing that is wrong? To some it might sound stupid, it might sound ludicrous, but who said it's wrong? Well, behaving like that feels right. It feels right to forgive. It feels right to let it go. And I'll tell you why it feels right. It's because when this happened to me, 
the probation service decided that a nice thing to do would be to take all the people who'd been affected by murder and manslaughter and give them a pamper weekend. And it was beautiful. There were therapies, there were spas, there was arts and crafts, there were photo photography courses. Anything you wanted to do, it was paid for. It was on the house and it was a beautiful hotel. It was one of the Mercour hotels and it was absolutely gorgeous. And it turned out that me and another girl were the only people there who had partners murdered. The rest of the people there had children murdered. Now, that made me sit back and think, oh my God, if I had a child murdered, how would I react? How would I feel? How would I think? And this, this course was nothing about forgiveness. This pamper weekend was nothing about forgiveness. It was only about um making sure that we and our well-being was looked after for a short time which was really really thoughtful but it was a restorative justice program and it was about trying to make peace with what had happened now trying to tell a parent to make peace with the person who murdered their child is like trying to melt an iceberg with a candle. It's just virtually impossible. Because that's not going to happen. And I found people there who were consumed with rage. Their physical bodies were twisted with disability. They were, their faces were contorted with pain and anguish. And I thought, thank God I have forgiven. Thank God. Because what that did, it took me away from the path of antidepressants and tranquilizers and sleepless nights and nightmares and rage and wanting revenge. And it took me away from so many negative things. But in forgiving, I had to sacrifice a lot of things. I had to sacrifice the bosom of the people who could not share my forgiveness. My partner's family, for one, I lost them because I forgave. But I had to do it. And it comes from a state of mind. It comes from how we think and feel about ourselves. It comes from how much respect we have for ourselves and whether we feel that we deserve to be trapped in this anger for life or whether we feel we deserve a way out. 